covenant of healthy relations. This is not a be nice covenant. This is a how to disagree peacefully and passionately covenant. And it's in the back of your bulletin if you want to take a look at it. But I'd recommend you take a look at it after this cluster of skits that Sandra has written with the help of the other members of the healthy relations team. And uh, they are going to show you how not to do it and then how to do it. We picked as our background uh, <clears throat> a tightly scheduled meeting room because we thought this fall while we're sharing time with the girls schools of Austin, the girls school of Austin that we might run into this type of situation. So our first skit takes place five minutes after one meeting is supposed to end and the next one begin. The leader from committee B <clears throat> opens the door without knocking and addresses the group. Sandra, your time's up. You should know that these rooms are tightly booked and be more respectful. Do I have to show you the schedule? We have this room now. Come on in. It's our turn. They know they should be gone by now. Cut. <laughs> our congregation covenants to nurture and protect by communicating with one another directly in a spirit of compassion and goodwill, and by disagreeing from a place of curiosity and respect. In this skit, Committee B's leader demonstrated several behaviors which were neither nurturing nor protecting. We saw speaking in a loud voice, coming in without knocking, shaming, and sarcasm. All of these behaviors are not in covenant and should be avoided. Enough said. Our next skit takes place 15 minutes after one meeting is supposed to end and the next one begin. Come in. Excuse me. Oh, you must have lost track of time. You know how tightly these rooms are booked. Why, you've kept us meeting, waiting 15 minutes. And you know this is not how we're supposed to keep our covenant. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> In this skit, you saw more behaviors which were neither nurturing nor protecting. <laughs> Specifically, you saw you statements, blaming, accusing, patronizing, and a tone of voice that sounded polite but was actually demeaning. As before, these behaviors are not in covenant and should be avoided. And now for our final skit. We hope you'll agree that this is a better way to, to respond to a situation that is not in covenant. Uh, the leader from Committee B knocks on the door only a couple of minutes after her meeting is supposed to begin. Come in. Excuse me, I know you've got a good reason for running late, but my committee really needs to get started. How soon can we have the room? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the last meeting ran late, and so we're running late, and we've really got a lot to get done. <clears throat> I see this has got you in a difficult spot. I just really need to know how, when we can have the room. <sighs> okay, um, give me uh, five minutes to wrap up, and uh, we'll be out of here. Thanks. Cut. <clears throat> in this skit, you saw behaviors which demonstrated forgiving ourselves and others when we fall short of expectations, showing good humor and the optimism required for moving forward. Specifically, you saw I statements, the use of a calm voice, and you saw Leader B assume goodwill on the part of Leader A when she stated, I'm sure you have a good reason for running late. When needs conflict, we tend to be drawn into reasons and justifications which can redirect the conversation. In this skit, you saw that Leader B did not get drawn in. She acknowledged A's, Leader A's difficulty and then simply repeated her central issue, which is access to the room. Without conflict and drama, a covenantal interaction is almost boring, but it can be effective. 
As a religious community, we are all striving to live by our covenant of healthy relations. We hope that these skits will alert you to church moments when we could do better and suggest ways to live out our covenant more fully. Thank you all so much. And if you all have suggestions as to other tough situations they might want to tackle in a skit, please don't hesitate to suggest. This is not really stump the Healthy Relations Committee, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they would be happy to take on uh, suggestions. This is our time of meditation because spending time in quiet gives our mind space to be gentler, it slows down time just a little bit, and it helps us see ourselves clearly. Our reading comes from Vivian Pomeroy. Forgive us that often we forgive ourselves so easily and others so hardly. Forgive us that we expect perfection from those to whom we show none. Forgive us for repelling people by the way we set a good example. Forgive us the folly of trying to improve a friend. Forbid that we should use our little idea of goodness as a spear to wound those who are different. Forbid that we should feel superior to others when we are only more shielded. And may we encourage the secret struggle of every person. Yom Kippur is the final day of the days of awe, the high holy days for our Jewish brothers and sisters. We in Unitarian Universalism are free to dance with a number of different traditions from a num num number of different um, religious traditions, and so we, we can participate somewhat, as a, uh, most of us as outsiders, in these high holy days, just knowing that Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year and the days in between are days in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are days when you think about atonement and forgiveness and reconciliation. Atonement means being made right with yourself, the world, and God. So let's talk about atonement first. And in order to talk about atonement, I got to talk about sin. And sin is not a word that we use in Unitarian Universalism that much. And I'm going to talk to you about why not. Um, it's difficult for us to talk about it. We, we, we don't think of the same things that our childhood churches or our neighbors' churches sometimes think of as sins. We don't think about them in the same way. And so um, some people will even say it's hard for a Unitarian Universalist to have a sense of sin or to feel like you're sinning. And, um, you know, I, I've told you before that all I need to do to have a sense of sin is like to, to take a, a water bottle that's empty and, and throw it in the trash, not in the recycling. That, that can shake me up for moments afterwards or to, to drive a great big SUV, which I did for many years because my sister gave it to me and um, it, was a, it was a love truck, but I, it was the kind of car I used to yell at on the street. and. Um, so the karma fairy got me. <laughs> Our denomination began several hundred years ago, uh, or began in its current form, in reaction to the Calvinist concepts of original sin. Um, John Calvin, of course, ruled Geneva and started the reform traditions, the most famous of which is Presbyterian. and. Um, Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan preacher who talked about uh, original sin. He was a Princeton-educated uh, New Englander. And the Calvinist view of sin was this in Jonathan Edwards' 
sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, he said, every sinner, every person is like a spider being held over a fire by the hand of an angry God. And all it takes is for God to go, and the spider is in the fire. That's the God you want to worship, isn't it? And Jonathan Edwards went on to say that God is completely justified in dropping us into the fire because um, we deserve no mercy, and yet God has mercy toward us by holding us just over the fire and not dropping us in. Um, so present-day Christians don't usually paint that gruesome a picture of... Um, of God, not even the Presbyterians anymore, and most of the mainstream Christians are painting pictures of God as a loving God who's interested in justice, and um, they still have to deal, though, with the theology of original sin, that, that you're just born into sin. Um, the North African church father named Augustine, or Augustine, depending on whether you're Catholic or Protestant, you pronounce it differently. Um, he is the one who came up with this idea that people are just born sinful. And a church council at the time declared it not true. Anathema was what they declared it. But then Calvin kind of uh, reborrowed it in the 1500s and made it his, his uh, election platform, basically. And so he said, and I was taught at Princeton Seminary, that human beings are born in sin. And that, it is, that means that it's easier for us to choose to do bad things than to choose to do good things. That we're predisposed to run from God. Okay, so Unitarian and Universalists in those early centuries taught that it is ridiculous that a loving God would have created people with free will and then punished them for using it. And it goes against our best reason to think that God set things up for humanity to fall into sin and then sent them to hell for failing. Most Unitarian Universalists teach that humans are born good, that a baby is born free from sin, and that because of influences in your neighborhood or in your family or in your culture, because of those influences, you do destructive things, bad things, things that people would t talk about as sins. Um, there was a Unitarian Universalist minister who wrote a lot of theology. His name is Forrester Church, and he said that the nature versus nurture argument is pretty much split uh, between the Calvinists and the Unitarians. The Calvinists think it's your nature to be sinful, and the Unitarians think it's your nurture to be sinful. Okay, and he says he believes strongly in both, which makes him a pretty typical UU colleague. He says, Sub subscribing to the genetic argument, I believe that we're born sinners, and equally convinced by the environmental argument, I believe that over time and through experience, sweet and bitter, we acquire an aptitude for sin. Am I alone in thinking aptitude for sin is kind of an appealing... Uh... <laughs> I'd like an aptitude for sin, please. Okay, wait a minute, we've got to get back to the sermon. So here, I'll tell you what I believe, which, um, because we are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, has absolutely no bearing on what you have to believe. But I'll just tell you what I think. And I think um, that sin is either nature or nurture. I think we're born good and bad, i.e. human. We're born human. And um, we keep acting out our some good, some bad nature. You know, we keep making some good decisions and some bad decisions, some selfless decisions and some selfish ones. And, um, you know, I hear people say, how could you believe a sweet little baby was born in sin? But those are really mostly people that don't have children yet. <laughs> because as a mother, I see romanticizing babies as... Um, as a sweet and innocent, almost laughable thing to do. They are self-centered little creatures who are beautiful and compelling enough, usually, to keep you from throwing them out the window. <laughs> the 14th night in a row, they've woken you up every hour and a half to eat, 
or just to hang out with you for 20 minutes before they go sweetly back to sleep again. Maybe you can and maybe you can't. So um, let's just put that debate aside about whether we do wrong things because it's our nature or because it's the result of forces at work upon us from our environment or whether we're acting out just our regular human nature. The fact remains, this is why we have Yom Kippur, most of us mess up. Most of us mess up. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. So I think of myself as a sinner, and I think, you know, yeah, if I'm ready for it, um, I can handle it better. When I won't be so surprised and shocked when I do something destructive. Um, and it helps me not be shocked and surprised and disappointed in other humans' behavior. Yeah, yeah, the, the treasurer at the church down the street ran off with the money, or uh, my neighbor ran off, joined the circus with the guy who used to spread the mulch on their plants, and they, you know... Um, is that a sin? I don't know. <sighs> a lot of times it's hard to tell, and, a, and, a, and it gives you, when you kind of expect people to mess up, it gives you compassion for them, and we do wrong things. And some of those things are just mistakes. You know, the word in Hebrew for sin can be translated missing the mark. You just, you know, you aimed at something, you missed the mark. The word in, in Buddhism for the state of the world is that it's out of joint. It's kind of like missing the mark. It's like something's just a little off. And some things we do not as a mistake. Some things we do just willfully, fully knowing that this is going to hurt people, and sometimes that doesn't make it wrong. You know, you can do stuff that's going to hurt people, like a surgeon, or a chiropractor, and you know, it makes it better afterwards. You know situations like that. Any gardener knows that some things, you plant them, they grow, they have their flowering, and then they're over. And then you pull them up and plant something else. It's the way of the world. It's the way of the earth, the planet, that teaches us how to be. So... What do we do when there are some things that we do that, that we feel terrible for because we knew we shouldn't have done them, we did them anyway, we caused some destruction that didn't help anything? What is our spiritual practice when that happens? Maybe you can't think of anything you've done like that. That is lovely, and I'm happy for you. And, and yet you have to have some way of, the rest of us, have to have some way of forgiving ourselves. I, I love the Jewish idea that if you do something wrong to someone else, you ask them to forgive you, not God, because you didn't do it to God. You did it to them. So you go to the person that you've wronged and ask for forgiveness. That's kind of like the 12 steps, too. You go make amends, see if you can. Um, it'll make a difference for you if it doesn't make a difference for them. Sometimes it's the hardest to forgive yourself, even if somebody else forgives you. You can't really forgive yourself, and you still wake up in the middle of the night cringing over that thing you did or weeping over the tears you caused. Yom Kippur is a time when it's built into the religious system for you to be able to forgive yourself if someone else has already forgiven you. You can cast away that guilt that you've been dragging along with you because there'll be new guilt that'll come along, you know. You just might as well get rid of the old guilt. Also, Yom Kippur is a time when, and I love this and I haven't seen this in any other religion, there's a time when if you've made a bad vow that you can't keep, there's a time when the book of life is still open, and you can either go to three peers, or you can go to a religious professional, and you can say, here is the vow I made. Here are 
the reasons I can't keep it anymore. I ask to be released from my vow. Oh, man. I think that is so liberating because many of us who've been married and divorced feel constantly guilty for the vows that we took when we were, you know, 13 years old, <laughs> or what seems like 13 now. And you say, I'm going to love you forever, and then you don't, or you can't. And that vow, what do you do with it? Do you just carry it around like a yoke for the rest of your life? No, you can say, I made a bad vow. I couldn't keep it. I asked to be released from that vow. And then you stand up straight and move on with your life. We forgive ourselves and each other, and we move on in love. This is a time for forgiving other people who've done wrong things to you, even if they haven't apologized in the right way, because they never do. Sometimes they apologize with a little fake apology, like, I'm sorry if something I did hurt you. <laughs> That's not an apology, by the way. Sometimes they apologize too fast before you've gotten a chance to say your thing. They're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you go, yeah, but it really hurt me. And they're like, I said I'm sorry. Any therapist will tell you that's an unfair fighting technique, premature <laughs> apology. We have this idea that people should ask for forgiveness by saying, tell me all of your hurt, and I will say I am was so wrong and you were so right and I'm I'm on my bended knee asking you to forgive and sometimes you'll get one like that which is lovely um, but really not that often so <laughs> during the days of awe during the high holy days we get a chance to forgive other people who ask our forgiveness even if they don't. Now, if somebody asks your forgiveness and they're still a toxic person, a dangerous person to you, if they molested you, if they hurt one of your children, no, no. You can forgive them just as a way of not carrying them around with you the rest of their life, your life, but you don't forget. You don't let yourself go near toxic people anymore because like, oh, I forgave and I forgot. <gasps> he did it again. You know, yeah, people don't, you can trust people to be themselves. So over the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, it says, never forget. So you can forgive. You don't have to forget. It's, it's up to you. Um, I don't have a problem with... Uh, with forgiving people. I don't even have a problem with forgiving people who really didn't ask for my forgiveness because I don't want to carry them around with me. I don't like that. One person I know said she felt like she had uh, these three people plugged into her body system, just draining her energy away because she hadn't forgiven them yet and she just had to kind of unplug them. I think that's a good way to, to think about it. But what about this? Now, some of y'all don't have any belief in any God at all, so you can just relax during this part. But if you do have a belief in God, or if you have this feeling about God doing things toward humans, um, sometimes God has done something to you that you can't forgive. A lot of people walk around really angry at God, which is okay. According to the Jewish tradition, you argue with God, you yell at God, you take God on in a wrestling match. All of those are faithful responses, but you stay in relationship. In Elie Wiesel's book, Night, and in his play, The Trial of God, he has inmates at Auschwitz in their despair call God to trial for allowing such evil to exist in the world. So they have a trial and they try God and after they pronounce God guilty, 
the inmates rise and recite the Kaddish, which proclaims God's sovereignty in the world. For a Jew, it is possible to argue with God, even to accuse God, but not to live without God. So maybe during this time, it's a time for some of us who feel a relationship with a God of some kind to let go of being mad at God because she let something awful happen or because he didn't help in a certain situation when if you'd been God, you would have helped. And maybe during this time we can let go of that draining resentment as well. So these high holy days are a chance to say to someone else, I'm heartily sorry for the wrongs I've done you and for any mistakes I may have made. Please forgive me. I'm thinking of having a portion of every service be fun with smartphones, and you can, if you want to, after the service is over, just take out your phone and text that to somebody for any mistakes I have made this year or for any wrongs I have done you, I'm heartily sorry. Bring out the vows you've made that you haven't been able to keep. See if you want to go visit somebody and ask to be released from that vow. This is a way of just keeping your soul healthy. It's the soul home repair manual that I keep reading out of every Sunday. We can make the world a better place, beginning with our own hearts and minds and spirits. Will you now please rise with me and sing hymn number 1031 from the Teal 